Well, good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's mission status briefing on the flight of Atlantis to the International Space Station. An eventful day on orbit with us uh, to discuss all of the details, the lead space shuttle flight director for STS-135, Quatsi Alabarujo. Quatsi. Thank you, Rob. We've had an absolutely outstanding rendezvous and docking today. Uh, the docking was accomplished with very few issues at all. In fact, uh, we're right on schedule and uh, the crew is ingressed the International Space Station and is preparing to hand off the orbiter boom sensor system to the space shuttle's robotic arm. The activities of the crew today started with uh, a power-up of the primary flight systems that are required for rendezvous and docking. Now, during that power-up, we did experience a, a slight problem with one of our general purpose computers, or GPCs. And essentially, uh, it was really just a, a transient problem that took one of those computers down for the rendezvous, and, and we had to rendezvous without it, but it represented simply a loss of redundancy. Now, what was going on with the computer is this. Uh, when we power up the flight systems for rendezvous and docking, we fly with three redundant computers that do all of the computations of the vehicle's trajectory, uh, assess its attitude, and help us do navigation to guide the space shuttle to a rendezvous and dock with the International Space Station. Now, those computers all talk on the same flight critical uh, data buses, and they listen to those data buses. And ideally, uh, those computers will be seeing and saying the exact same things. And they also uh, talk to each other and compare notes, if you will. And if any one of the computers uh, is, is outputting something that's different than the others, uh, the, the uh, majority essentially votes that computer into a failed state. Now, as we're powering up those computers uh, to prepare for the rendezvous and dock, uh, we physically flip a switch in the cockpit that takes uh, the computers that were asleep into uh, an active state. And uh, the switches on those computers have, have detents that can be a little bit uh, temperamental from time to time. And if you don't uh, decisively and carefully move the, the switch from one position to the other, uh, there could be a, a slight rebounding effect that makes the contacts of the switch come off the detent uh, ever so slightly and for, for the briefest of seconds. That happened with our computer number three as the crew was bringing that computer to an active state. Uh, the switch came off the detent for just a split second, but just long enough for the other two computers that were up to, uh, to see a change in its state and vote that computer to a failed state. We don't think that there's anything physically wrong with the computer, and, and in fact, uh, we have to, uh, have to load a new, uh, a new software image to it. We're going to try to do that tomorrow. Uh, at the beginning of the crew's day. Uh, so we were able to fly the rendezvous and docking today with uh, two of the three computers that we normally have up. Uh, that's perfectly within our flight experience and perfectly within our flight rules. Uh, it just represented a loss of redundancy, but we had absolutely no other problems with the spacecraft other than that. Uh, an interesting thing for you to note, this exact same problem, the last time it happened was on STS-122, which was also a flight of Atlantis. Um, and uh, there were one or two other commonalities between this flight and that flight, which I'll, I'll let folks research at their leisure. Uh, but uh, again, this we don't think was a, a symptom of a, of a real hardware problem, and we expect to be able to get this computer back to full functionality here in, uh, in the next day or so. Uh, after we got all of the uh, rest of the systems powered up, the crew got into the rendezvous checklist uh, right on schedule, uh, and they were running very well, uh, very well on the pace the whole day. Uh, the actual rendezvous was accomplished with, uh, with, with, with no issues. Uh, the crew managed their on-orbit tasking very well, just as they did yesterday during the TPS inspections. And uh, it was an absolutely spectacular sight when uh, Atlantis arrived on the R-bar, uh, which is basically uh, underneath the, uh, the International Space Station, and began its uh, R-bar pitch maneuver. In fact, we have some video of the R-bar pitch maneuver, which we were able to capture in real time and would be happy to show you. When the uh, space shuttle uh, arrives uh, on the R-bar, uh, the, the commander sort of uh, pitches upward uh, to begin uh, essentially a uh, backflip, if you will, of uh, the space shuttle. And when it is essentially on its back uh, with its belly facing the International Space Station, the uh, crew on board the space station uh, today uh, consisting of um, three crew members, each with a different uh, resolution camera, We'll take uh, high-resolution imagery of the underside of the, the space shuttle's thermal protection system 
to assess the, the physical condition of the tiles to make sure that uh, there was no debris damage uh, on ascent or during its orbital travel to the space station that would present a problem or concern for successful reentry. And so as the shuttle is, is pitching back, uh, the way you see in the video, uh, there'll be lots of photos, literally hundreds of photos uh, taken with a high-speed digital camera. Those photos will be downlinked uh, via the space station's communication assets, and uh, then the photos will be assessed by uh, engineering teams, and ultimately within the next uh, few days, hopefully the, the entire shuttle's thermal protection system will be cleared. And that's, uh, that's about uh, as much of the video as, as uh, you'll probably want to see, um, because the rest, of course, is just, uh, just more, uh, more of the same. But it really is a spectacular sight. We were very fortunate today with their trajectory. The International Space Station had uh, the high-rate KU band uh, communications link uh, during the RPM, so we were able to see that in mission control real time. Uh, it was a very special moment for the flight control team that was uh, watching the, the fruit of their labors uh, as far as guiding Atlantis to its rendezvous and docking with the space station and uh, we were very excited to see that. Uh, after we completed the rendezvous pitch maneuver, uh, we maneuvered uh, flawlessly to the uh, V-bar, which is essentially uh, directly in front of the International Space Station, and Commander Chris Ferguson uh, guided the spacecraft to an absolutely flawless and very smooth uh, contact and docking uh, at PMA-2, or the pressurized mating adapter number two. Following that, uh, the docking mechanism uh, was uh, leveraged to, uh, to drive the, the hooks in, drive the ring in, uh, so that we got hard mate uh, between Atlantis and uh, the ISS, and then we maneuvered uh, the joint uh, shuttle space station stack back to its nominal uh, torque equilibrium attitude, or the nominal attitude that we will fly for the duration of the mission. Uh, at the time I left MCC, we had just uh, opened hatches, and at, at this hour, uh, the crew of Atlantis is on board the International Space Station uh, participating in a uh, standard safety briefing, and uh, the rest of the day will be spent uh, removing the orbiter boom sensor system from the shuttle's payload bay with the space station robotic arm and handing that off to the space shuttle's robotic arm so that that, uh, so that, that appendage will be out of the way uh, when we prepare to install the MPLM in the morning. And so uh, that's, uh, that's the day's activities so far. Uh, so far, everything is going very well. Uh, and again, just as yesterday, we're not tracking significant problems, just that one issue with the computer, which we think we'll be able to resolve in the morning. And so that's, uh, that's my summary, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Kratzi. We'll take questions here in Houston. We do have a quartet of reporters on the phone bridge as well. Uh, so if you could use the floor, Mike. Uh, appreciate it. It's right behind Robert there. And we'll start off with uh, Mark. Hey, thank you, Mark Crow for Aviation Week. And uh, just a quick question on the, uh, on the GPC. Uh, what do you need it to do for the rest of the mission? And uh, I know you used to carry spares. I don't know whether you still do or not. Would you replace it if you do, or, or can you just work around that? Okay, great question. Uh, right now, we, we do not carry spare GPCs uh, on the shuttle for these missions. Uh, it was decided some years ago that with the redundancy that we have, uh, we have five of these computers on board, uh, that it was not necessary for us to carry spares. Uh, we have five of them on board so that uh, we can sustain uh, failures and still have sufficient redundancy in, uh, in the flight critical computations to guide the spacecraft uh, to a safe rendezvous or to uh, a safe uh, entry. So uh, we're not so much concerned about that. Now, as far as what we need to do with the computer from here, uh, when uh, the other computers in what we call the common set, that is essentially the, the council of computers that, that look at each other and make sure that everyone's saying the same thing, when, when the common set essentially votes the, uh, the anomalous computer out of the set, we, uh, in this instance, given how it happened, we have to uh, essentially reload the computer from the uh, onboard hard drive so that uh, it's got a fresh software image, all of the uh, failure flags and error flags are reset, and, uh, and so that that computer can then participate in operations. So that, uh, what we call IPL, initial program load, that process takes about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, we're trying to carve out some time in the cruise day tomorrow morning to get that done. And uh, once we see a successful uh, IPL, we'll probably let that computer uh, co probably let that computer run for several hours and then put it in its uh, sleep mode, which is its normal, uh, its normal state during docked ops. Yes, sir. 
Dan Vergano with USA Today. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about this being the final docking um, of the shuttle to the space station. Uh, do you still need this particular docking hatch? What will be used for in the future? And you know, can you say a little bit what were your thoughts knowing that this was the last time this was going to happen with the shuttle? Okay. Well, uh, as far as the use of the hardware, uh, this particular docking port, uh, the pressurized mating adapter, it was designed to support the uh, uh, the uh, the APDS system, uh, which is is uh, part of the uh, shuttle's uh, orbiter docking system. It's actually of Russian design. Uh, so it's designed to be compatible with uh, with that hardware. So we won't really use this particular port for a visiting vehicle, certainly not for the foreseeable future, uh, not for uh, for quite a while. So uh, this pressurized mating adapter might be used for a closet, actually, uh, when they're not being used to support that transfer of crew back and forth uh, between the ISS and the space shuttle, sometimes we do use these pressurized mating adapters to uh, alleviate some of our uh, our stowage concerns on board, uh, to store hardware that we uh, that we don't use uh, as regularly, and so uh, we're, we're thinking about utilizing this uh, this pressurized mating adapter for that purpose after the shuttle leaves. Now, with this being the the final rendezvous and docking of shuttle to the the space station, I I have to say, in in my observation. Uh, particularly fairly early in our shift, I think uh, everybody on the flight control team was was feeling it. You know, uh, on a typical mission, we exercise rendezvous and docking more than we exercise most things uh, in the orbit phase because it tends to be uh, the most complex uh, series of operations that we do on orbit. And so uh, this is a day that we have rehearsed considerably. We've committed more training time to executing this day well than we have to, to all of the other objectives. And so this really represented a, a big game day, if you will, uh, for my team. And so on the one hand, I know we all felt a great sense of excitement and a great sense of anticipation as we uh, came to participate in, in this highly complex, highly technical, and um, uh, very precise series of operations. But at the same time, I think it, it did start to weigh on, on the team in my, in my perception um, that, uh, that it was going to be the last one. And so, uh, uh, again, you know, my, my team is filled with consummate professionals, some of the best I've ever worked with. And so there was certainly no emotional impediment to good performance today. But uh, I think it's fair to say that, that uh, the, uh, the finality of, of uh, our executing this particular series of operations was, was felt. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, could you uh, give us an update on uh, where your cryo margins uh, look today? Okay, that's, that's a great question. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, right now, uh, we have uh, had a chance to, to thoroughly assess uh, how the cryo margins are shaping up. Uh, the, that is the, uh, the margin of cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen, hydrogen that we have to generate power. And we believe that we are looking at about one day, three hours uh, above our nominal 12 plus zero plus two day mission. And so uh, if this continues to persist and, and uh, this amount of margin remains stable, uh, we'll ask the uh, mission management team probably uh, the day after tomorrow on flight day five to, uh, to formally uh, give us permission to extend a day and uh, fill the additional day with, uh, with other objectives. The reason we're going to wait for another couple of days, uh, you know, there are a variety of, of things that influence the amount of uh, cryogenics that, that you can see and extract from the tank. Uh, you know, the cryogenic oxygen, hydrogen, it's basically liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and uh, a variety of, of factors, including dynamic motion from attitude maneuvers, rendezvous burns, uh, can cause some of that uh, liquid gas to liquid hydrogen and oxygen to, to, to go back and forth between its gaseous state and its liquid state. Uh, and so uh, sometimes uh, you, you may uh, see a decrease in the pressure, which suggests a decrease in quantity. And so there's just some variability in, uh, in the quantities that we see from time to time. And uh, so over the course of time, these variable transients uh, stabilize and, and we're able to uh, assess them statistically and determine that we do have the amount of, of, uh, of, of consumables in the tanks that we believe we do. And so uh, we just want to give ourselves uh, that additional time to make sure that we are comfortable with the margin we have before we commit to use, uh, use that additional resource. Just a quick uh, follow to, to clarify, um, does that, uh, that one plus three hours include the, the, the MPLM shell heaters, that buyback that you were talking about pre-flight? That, uh, that 
revised margin that I quoted you, one day, three hours, that assumes that we do not power the MPLM heaters uh, uh, in the shuttle payload bay. So uh, basically, this is the margin based on the plan we believe, or excuse me, based on the plan that we are executing. Uh, so uh, this is what we think we'll have. So we think we, we have sufficient margin uh, with the plan that we're on right now to, uh, to, to go ahead and, and extend the mission today. Again, that formal decision won't be made until uh, probably the day after tomorrow, but all of the conditions uh, are aligning to uh, be able to, to extend the mission by one day. Denise. Denise Chow at space.com. Um, since this will be probably for at least a, a while, the last time that more than six people will be at the space station at one time, um, I was wondering if you could speak about the significance of that and um, particularly in regard to the importance of this mission to the future of the space station. Well, this mission uh, is, is very important to the future of the space station um, because, you know, as has been reported before, uh, our agency and our country is, is in the midst of a significant shift in policy uh, when it comes to, uh, to space exploration, particularly uh, our utilization of space in low Earth orbit. Uh, we are now uh, moving into a season where we're attempting to leverage the services of commercial providers uh, who uh, heretofore have, have not uh, uh, significantly flown people uh, in space. Uh, of course, commercial companies have been flying uh, satellites and other uh, uh, uncrewed tech in space for some time. And so uh, there's a lot that's new about, uh, about the policy. There's a lot that's new about uh, figuring out how to do operations uh, with the commercial providers. And the commercial providers themselves are, are developing their space systems uh, and preparing to certify them to carry people. Uh, that process is proceeding uh, along a, a fairly expected trajectory. However, one thing that's absolutely certain in spaceflight is that the job is, is always going to be harder uh, than it appears to be at first glance. And so the supplies that this crew is bringing to the International Space Station uh, really are, are sort of insurance. Um, because once we retire the shuttles, then uh, until we get the commercial providers online or, or some other uh, uh, regular cargo and crew delivery system online, uh, then we'll be limited in, in how much we can resupply the International Space Station. So these supplies that we're delivering, as well as the spare parts, which is also very important, will enable us to keep the core systems, uh, to keep the crew, and to keep the research that's uh, ongoing uh, on the space station uh, ongoing at its nominal planned pace uh, through the end of 2012. And so that's, uh, that's, that's vitally important to the agency. Uh, and I think it's critical to uh, the transition in space policy that we're attempting to make. As far as the significance, uh, I know just judging from my observation of the crew, uh, the shuttle crew as, as they greeted the space station crew, I think the significance of, of this last visit by a shuttle crew and this last visit by uh, as large a crew to the International Space Station, I know the significance of that is felt by the astronauts on board. Uh, you could tell, uh, you, could, you could sense a, a palpable um, increase in emotion uh, from all of the crew members, not just our, our U.S. astronauts flying on board the space shuttle, but even uh, our international partner astronauts on the International Space Station. They were extremely happy and, and uh, really elated to, uh, to see their visitors. And I know that they really recognize and appreciate the significance of these moments. More questions here in Houston? If not, we'll go to the phone bridge. Uh, Marsha Dunn, you there? Yes, hi. This is uh, Chris Paul tomorrow with Reuters. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, well, hang on, Chris. Or we're going to get to you in order, but Marsha Dunn goes first in order. Uh, right, sorry. Thank you. I was wondering if I, I was wondering what kind of emotions washed over you, Quatsi, when you, you saw Atlanta up close for the first time. Um, as it was approaching the space station, since we aren't going to see that too much more. I'll tell you what, what was going through my mind. Uh, I was really having a number of, of flashbacks. Uh, my very first experience uh, with Atlantis was, uh, uh, was, was really as a, as a trainee. Uh, the very first time that, that I saw the operation of Atlantis from mission control was my very first year here at NASA in, in 1995. 
uh, I was uh, doing some on-the-job training with uh, Shuttle Life Support Systems Officer on STS-71, which was the very first time that a space shuttle has docked with a space station. That was the very first docking of the space shuttle with the space station Mir. And so uh, I found myself, as I was looking at this craft, particularly as it was up close and during the RPM, uh, thinking about uh, the, the, really the, the defining moments in my career here uh, that have been marked by the presence and the, the, the flight of this particular space shuttle. And uh, it, uh, I, I, I won't say that I got close to, uh, close to, to welling up in the eyes, but, but I will say that it, it, was, it was a powerful moment for me. Uh, one, obviously, that I tried to keep uh, relatively discreet uh, so as uh, not to be a distraction to the, the team of flight controllers that I was leading. Uh, but I know they were all feeling very similar uh, emotions, uh, thinking about where we've come from, how much we've accomplished in the last, uh, you know, 15 plus years for me. And um, it's, uh, I was not feeling sadness, um, but, it, but just sort of that, uh, that understandable and, and common um, and sober uh, anticipation of, of what's coming next, uh, of, of, of what the transition to the next phase of my career and the next phase of my life will be. That's really what preoccupied, uh, preoccupied my thoughts, other than uh, making sure that my computer problem really was a, a switch issue and not something more nefarious. Thank you so much. Okay, next uh, up in order, Alan Boyle, MSNBC, you there? Yeah, hi, uh, this is Alan Boyle with MSNBC. I wanted to ask whether docked operations will change the dynamic that you were talking about yesterday, uh, where the four uh, astronauts on the crew have more room, things are more comfortable. Uh, how is that going to change now that it's uh, 10 people instead of four? Well, one of the things that's working for us is the International Space Station uh, is a huge complex, and when you combine that with the uh, the space that's in the orbiter, uh, I think there will be uh, there will be plenty of room to operate. Uh, I think this crew will continue to be uh, very efficient. For the next uh, several days, the name of the game will be cargo transfer. Uh, when you look at, at downlink video, you're going to see uh, bag upon bag upon bag, uh, you know, moving across the hatches uh, from various stowage locations on the ISS to the orbiter and vice versa. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's really gonna, go, going to going to to dominate the video. I think it'll be like uh, almost like uh, watching uh, uh, an army of ants uh, moving in and out of an anthill carrying their cargo. Uh, although the astronauts are obviously considerably considerably bigger. Uh, I think the crew will continue to be very efficient. Uh, I think we'll make very good use of, uh, of all crew members on the International Space Station. There will be uh, a break in the, 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 transfer, um, uh, the transfer operations for us to do the spacewalk uh, on flight day five. And so uh, there'll be considerable uh, focus on, on making sure that that goes well. Uh, but uh, I think uh, I think given that we are still going to end up having fewer crew members on the sp both spacecraft than we've had on uh, the preceding missions, uh, we will see some efficiencies gained uh, just by virtue of the fact that you're uh, tripping over fewer people, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we'll be sort of making up a, a relative deficit of 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 uh, of, of crew power uh, with fewer people. So I think after all said and done, uh, we're going to stay on the timeline, maybe get a little bit ahead. Uh, this crew obviously is proving themselves to be uh, incredibly capable. So uh, my, my, money's, uh, my money's on us being able to accomplish uh, just a little bit more than we even thought we would. Great. Thank you. Okay. Now on to you, Chris Baltimore from Reuters. Yes, thank you. Chris Baltimore from Reuters, and apologies for jumping the gun. Uh, just a, another uh, quick question on the GPC. Um, if you could uh, um, let us know uh, what the, uh, the flight parameters are for how many of those computers need to be operational for the, the shuttle to be able to continue its operations, and just so I can understand uh, uh, how this works, uh, there, there are five of these computers uh, on board, and uh, three of them uh, are running in tandem at any given time. Is, is that correct? Okay, great question. Let me uh, let me summarize uh, uh, data processing systems 101 for you, and I'll try not to bore anyone. Uh, typically, during ascent and entry, which are arguably the most complex and critical phases of flight, uh, we have 
all five computers up uh, in, uh, in a redundant set, uh, all looking, and, and, uh, looking at the same buses, monitoring the same buses, and talking to each other to make sure that they essentially all agree in their calculations, because arguably uh, during ascent and during entry, the, the atmospheric parameters that have to be managed by the flight control system, uh, as well as the uh, engine performance and attitude control, all of that uh, has to be done by computer because the parameters change faster than any human being could could uh, could really manage uh, in piloting. And so uh, we have uh, five of them running at the same time. The idea is that uh, we could uh, sustain a failure of two of them and still have uh, a, a, a quorum to vote, if you will. Uh, as long as you have uh, three computers, you know, you could uh, Take a failure of one of them, and, and the two others could 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 vote that computer out. So, uh, five computers is really uh, uh, massively redundant, if you will, and and we feel we require that redundancy for ascent and entry. Now, of those five computers, one of the computers runs a completely different version of the software that was uh, designed to a different specification and 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 run uh, and, and and coded by a different uh, different software provider. That's our backup flight system. Uh, to uh, guard against uh, a, a uh, uh, endemic and insidious uh, software issue that would affect the other four computers. So that's generally what we do. Now for on-orbit operations, uh, particularly uh, rendezvous and docking, uh, because our rendezvous and docking burns uh, that we do are often critical, they're critical from a trajectory perspective and critical from a timeline perspective, we like to fly with uh, three of those computers in, uh, in a redundant set, again, so that we have uh, enough redundancy to where we could take uh, one or two failures and still have a functioning computer uh, to fly by. Now, in the instance that we had today where we lost one of those computers, it simply took away some of our re redundancy. And uh, so we, we just called that our first failure, if you will, and continued to fly on uh, the, two, uh, the two computers that we had up. Now, during docked phases, like, uh, like where we are right now, uh, we typically only have uh, one uh, GNC computer up uh, and then another computer uh, that, uh, that does our, our systems management functions for environmental control, thermal control, that, uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, so right now we've got, we've got no impact to orbiter functionality. If on the off chance this computer does not come back, if GPC-3 does not come back as we expect it to, uh, then that represents uh, essentially uh, uh, a notable loss of redundancy for entry. Uh, we can still perform a safe entry, but it's just one of those things that we'll uh, have to uh, identify sooner rather than later so that the entry flight director, Tony Sakachi can start talking about that and examine any changes to procedures uh, to the entry, uh, the orbit and entry procedures that we might, might need to look at. Okay, uh, just to follow up and uh, not, not to get you carried away with uh, contingencies, what, what if you lose another one after that? What, what, uh, how does that affect your procedures? Uh, losing two computers uh, prior to entry uh, is, again, a, a significant and notable loss of redundancy. Um, you know, we'd have to assess each situation uh, as it as it arose, try to understand what the what the failures are. But from a physical data processing capability perspective, the shuttle can re-enter with uh, with three computers and re-enter safely. But again, you know, the thing that would be of great concern to us is understanding the nature of the failure. Losing two computers in a single flight uh, would uh, is is highly unlikely. And and of course, when you're talking about computers, uh, you want to examine uh, whether or not there's again some systemic uh, software issue or or some systemic operating systems issue that might affect multiple computers as opposed to just a discrete hardware failure. Thank you very much for your patience. You're more than welcome. Okay, and Todd Halverson from Florida today. Todd Halverson, Florida today. Can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can, Todd. Okay. Um, I just uh, was wondering if the uh, shuttle could um, re-enter safely with only one GPC operating properly. And um, just to make sure I understand the flight rule, if you were to lose uh, three, I, I guess you would have to uh, come home at the next opportunity. What's the flight rule on GPCs? Thanks. 
Uh, I think you've got the the big picture correct. Uh, if we lose more than uh, more than than two computers, uh, we consider that a, a significant loss of redundancy that uh, that that has uh, safety implications to uh, to uh, the crew. We would be looking at uh, looking at coming home at, at earliest opportunity. Uh, I don't have the flight rule in front of me, Todd, so I'm I'm not gonna gonna uh, profess to to quote it from memory. Although I think you've captured the the spirit of of uh, of what's in that rule. Okay, thanks. And just to uh, clarify, the show is capable of landing uh, safely on one GPC tanks? Theoretically, it is, it is certainly capable of landing on one GPC. That's absolutely a, a situation that we would never, ever want to be in uh, to uh, have to re-enter on one computer. Um, but but again, you know, one computer is capable of driving all of the uh, all of the flight critical buses. It's designed to do that. Uh, we have five so that they can all five drive the flight critical buses uh, in in uh, in tandem uh, with redundancy. Uh, but uh, having only one computer, you can land the spacecraft. Uh, it's uh, not at all the situation that we would want to be in, but uh, but it is possible. Thanks. That's all for me, Rob. Okay, thanks, Todd. Uh, back here in Houston, any follow-ups, Gina? Um, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Have you had a situation in the past where you've lost more than one GPC that you know of? You know, I, I can't recall off the top of my head. At least, not certainly not since I've been uh, flight director have we have we lost more than one GPC and and at least you know within the last several years our, our experience with these computers is that they've been very reliable most of the problems we've had have been the exact situation we had uh, today which we we uh, affectionately call a, a switch tease uh, where uh, where the switch backs off the detent for a split second and the, the computer gets failed out of the out of the common set um, but uh, I'd have to get you an answer as far as uh, if we've had real hardware failures uh, uh, in the uh, in the distant past, but certainly not in the recent past. Anything else? Okay, seeing no further questions, uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, a reminder, as uh, this briefing uh, is ongoing, uh, the mission management team has begun its daily meeting uh, over in the uh, control center. The uh, chair of the MMT, Leroy Kane, who's the deputy shuttle program manager, will be here at 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, to conduct his MMT briefing. Atlantis's crew and uh, the station crew will be heading to bed in about uh, five hours or so, just before 6 p.m. Central Time. Our flight day three highlights, including all of that spectacular video of the R bar pitch maneuver and uh, the docking and the hatch opening and everything uh, that has followed, uh, will begin to air at 8 p.m. Central Time tonight and will be replayed every hour on the hour throughout the crew's sleep period. The uh, shuttle station crews will be awakened just before 2 a.m. Central Time. And tomorrow, of course, is the heavy hauling of the Raffaello Multipurpose Logistics Module to get cargo operations underway, which is uh, the crux of this mission. Uh, you can follow all the activities on both the shuttle and the station on our website at www.nasa.gov. Until then, we'll see you back here at 3 o'clock for the MMT briefing. Thanks a lot.